the um, Tonight is the 242nd anniversary of the Battle of Long Island or the Battle of Brooklyn. And that is significant to we Marylanders uh, for this reason. Um, <clears throat> on August the 27th, 1776, General Washington's army was trapped on Long Island and the Battle of Brooklyn ensued. It was the largest battle of the Revolutionary War, and General Washington's uh, troops were trapped um, on Long Island and had to escape to Manhattan. <clears throat> I'm going to make that smaller now, though, so you can see me as I discuss this. Okay, so General uh, Washington had to get his army off Long Island and onto Manhattan where it would be protected from the British Army. But in order to do that, he had to select uh, one regiment to attempt to hold off the British force, which in various accounts was eight to 10,000 men. And this was the 1st Maryland Regiment, um, which had about 270 men. And those, uh, that regiment attacked the British. Uh, the British had set, set up a headquarters at what is called the Old Stone House in, Britain, in Brooklyn. Uh, it was built in 1699, and the British set up a headquarters there. Uh, it still exists. It's a historical site in Brooklyn. And at one point it was the uh, headquarter, the clubhouse of the Brooklyn Dodgers, among other things. But on this particular day, the British had their headquarters in this building, which was made of stone. So it was protecting them from uh, gunshot outside. And the Maryland line, the, Mar the first, Mar uh, first Maryland regiment, uh, attacked this strong point six times during the day, 242 years ago today. At the end of the battle, General Washington uh, was up above this battle <clears throat> on Cobble Hill and near the intersection of today's Court Street and Atlantic Avenue. And he reportedly said, good God, what brave fellows I must this day lose. Um, Two hundred and fifty six of them were buried in an unmarked grave, which now is under the streets of Brooklyn, New York. And um, the strength of the of the Marylanders um, was what saved uh, Washington's army because he was able to escape the rest of the Continental Army into Manhattan while this action was going on. A hundred years later, in the 1860s, a historian said that this was the most important moment in the history of liberty, uh, because if Washington's army had been destroyed on that day, uh, the American Revolution would have been over. And you can decide for yourself what would have happened historically after that time. Um, but uh, as you can see, as Marylander, uh, it, it I'm very moved by this stand of the 1st Maryland Regiment, and it is, um, we also call it the Maryland Line, and it's the reason why the motto of the state of Maryland is the Old Line State. Um, and, um, well, there'll be more to say about this at a, on another occasion, but I want to uh, commemorate the anniversary today. <clears throat> okay.
Now, uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about this experience I had. Uh, and let me uh, do one other thing now. Just want to put this up for a few frames uh, because I, we're going to talk about the opposites and the significance of the opposites. Um, so I just wanted that in the in the video. <clears throat> okay. Well, on Saturday morning, um, I had a sort of a revelatory experience. Sometimes early in the morning, especially, I have a rush of ideas which come through, and I when that happens i know that i should get up and write down what i what i was experiencing and it turns out to be quite creative to do it that way and so uh, i wrote what turned out when i later uh, typed it out it turned out to be about 11 pages long uh, and i i entitled this uh, the divine drama and I think it's important to talk about because it pulls together a lot of ideas which are out there in the world that maybe we don't think en about enough. And so, um, so first I want to say, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through my notes from this experience. Uh, there are a couple places where it's a little repetitious, but these are complex ideas, so I think they bear repetition. And then um, what I'll be happy if uh, the subscribers do is uh, you can have a chat among yourselves or make your own comments on the chat. I may not stop too much during this uh, revelation. And... Uh, if we don't get through it very much, or if we don't get entirely through it, then I will uh, come back and look at the chat later and we can discuss it again further. I do have John here to uh, kibitz with me, however, <laughs> and so we may have some conversation here, but I'm, I'm just going to blast through it, and uh, I hope that's satisfactory to everyone. Okay, so the divine drama takes place in the collective unconscious, and it takes place in the collective unconscious of all humanity, 7.5 billion strong. Every Everyone is involved in it. And it is the evolution basically of the psyche and of the unconscious, if you will. Now, this comes into the area of religion. So, first of all, I want to ask the question, why are religions right, as in correct right? And I take a quote from paragraph 752 of Answer to Job, which is, but religious statements, without exception, have to do with the reality of the psyche, and not with the reality of the physis. Now, what that means is that everything that's involved in religion is a psychic fact. It's not a physical fact. And that's where we have a fundamental difference between the scientific method and Jungian psychology, because the scientific method wants the events to be occurring in the physical world, but they don't. They occur in the psychic world, the, the psyche. And um, so they are psychic facts, and therefore they're all true somewhere. In other words, if you have a psychic fact in your psyche, uh, it is true to you. And that would be true of everyone from every religion. So why are all religions wrong? They all sold magic to early Iron Age men. So, in other words, um, they were various leaders who were trying to explain things 
to one another and to their followers and they didn't have much knowledge or experience themselves and they were doing the best they could and so they ended up coming up with a series of myths which hung together uh, but as the scientific method began to show in 1500 or so um, they were not true in the physical world and this caused a great deal of consternation and may have been the cause of the very bloody 20th century so there the stories don't hold water anymore not only in christianity but in all uh, religions from a physical point of view from the point of view of the physical world and so myths have been consistently proven untrue by science however why are all religions right they are all developed organically as systems of mental hygiene now they were developed by people who didn't know what mental hygiene was there, there was no real discussion of psychology until the 19th century so the people that were developing religions um, didn't realize that they were uh, dealing with mental hygiene per se but they 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 all developed organically as systems of mental hygiene all are based on psychic facts not physical facts and they are true as such just because their myths don't hold water anymore doesn't mean that they don't have value to society and what that value is is a mystery and i'll be getting into that a little bit more in a few moments so i'm going to ask the um the reporters questions who what when where why how so who was doing this it was shamans and medicine men and uh, priests and elders of the society and what were they doing they were spontaneously developing methods of mental hygiene and those methods of mental hygiene became also political tools and so the powers that be could say god wants x uh, and for example um, in medieval Europe God wants a cathedral and so you burn up a lot of uh, testosterone and other things by spending a hundred years building a cathedral <clears throat> um, and when you have a when you have a cathedral behind you who can say no okay and so especially during medieval times and middle ages times um, people who were making these magical statements um, were hard to argue with so when okay so when was uh, beginning about 5,000 years ago nothing there was nothing to stop them from that time until the scientific methods started to come in and started to uh, put holes in all their psychic containers and then we started to have problems and where did this happen it happened everywhere all living creatures are evolving and all human beings are evolving in our psyche across the world and why well i'm not sure there's an answer to that but as carl sagan had it in cosmos it's what hydrogen atoms do given 13.8 billion years of evolution and how um, dr young pointed out that there was tra uh, that transformations had to come and they added more and more complexity and dr jung spoke about these transformations in his early book symbols of transformation uh, which in its earliest form was called psychology of the unconscious but in its 40 year later uh, reincarnation if you will it became uh, symbols of transformation and so 
these things started to come up spontaneously everywhere in the world. And so, for example, uh, the mandala, uh, Dr. Jung points out that there are examples of mandala paintings in Zimbabwe from 35,000 uh, years ago. And so the transformations that religions provide for are transformations like baptism and, um, and then confirmation, marriage, and funerals. Uh, and so let's just talk about that a little bit. Uh, I had one of my religious experiences during the baptism of a grandchild who I was carrying around the church during the baptism ceremony at, at, to introduce him to the congregation. And I had this experience of a special kind of light lighting up the faces of various congregants as they were accepting this grandchild into the community of congregants. And um, I can't explain that experience, but nonetheless, it happened to me. Uh, then the next level is confirmation, where you actually are taught something and accept the ideas of that religion, as Dr. Jung pointed out, and, for himself, and which also happened to me, is that that particular transformation from a religious point of view had no effect on him, and it had no effect on me. I, I didn't feel anything either. But I think all of us have a emotional reaction to marriage, and of course the transformation that's involved with that is the transformation of the couple that's marrying to move from uh, their father's and mother's homes to having a home of their own. And so that's a psychological transformation that has to occur where you have to grow up. And then uh, just a quick further example is funerals where the purpose of a funeral is to help people deal with their grief on the loss of a loved one. Now, recently, my wife was insisting that I pay attention to um, a, I guess he's a philosopher uh, named Ken Wilbur, and one of our subscribers had referred me to Ken Wilber some months ago, and I had bought two books of his, one of which is called No Boundary, which gives a baseline of ideas from Ken Wilber. I'm not going to tell you too much about it right now, but I, I just want to emphasize three key points from Ken Wilber, which are uh, wake up, clean up, and grow up. And what Wilbur was saying is that um, just because you wake up and have had a religious experience, so then you know you've gotten that religious fundamental experience under your belt, it doesn't mean that you've cleaned up or grown up. And so, and he says these are different parameters entirely and that what we need to be doing is not only waking up and realizing that there is something beyond the physical world which, which is specifically in the unconscious and also in the collective unconscious but when he talks about cleanup he's talking about learning how to properly manage our emotions so that we don't uh, get into too many fist fights, for example, if somebody calls you a name. <clears throat> and uh, then grow up, that relates to uh, the fact that we have to stop believing in magic. And, um, you know, obviously there are you know, people have magical ideas about religion, and I'll get into why um, those are 
invalid, but they also have a certain validity. And let me give you a couple of examples. They, they're the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus are real. They're just not magic. They are symbols of parental love, and that does not make them wrong. They are right. Um, there was a famous story years ago, uh, which is called, um, Yes, Virginia, There is a Santa Claus. And the point is that we have to grow up and recognize that Santa Claus is a symbol for parental love, but he's not a physical entity and nobody's going to come down your, your chimney. Um, so one other book of Ken Wilber's, which is um, important, is a book called Integral Vision. So I recommend that you take a look at those two books, No Boundary and Integral Vision. And then he has written separately on most of the major religions in the world. So that's also very interesting. Now, um, I want to mention Jordan Peterson for a moment, and I'll be referring to him later on. Uh, some people have called him uh, Jung Light, and I've been reading Maps of Meaning in audible form for the last month or so. I'm very near the end at this point, and um, I, I'll be talking about that. Uh, but there's certain issues about uh, Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning, although I think it's an incredible book and uh, it's extremely tightly packed. And so you really need to pay attention to his lectures on Maps of Meaning to really un start to unpack what he is talking about. But it relates to why, why could Dr. Jung never get his point across? And that goes to paragraph 63 of his famous book, Ion, Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self, which we're covering in the Advanced Reading Group. And in that paragraph, uh, Dr. Jung points out that zoological criticism, zoological criticism means nothing to the duck-billed platypus. And the point is that um, you can say anything you want about the duck-billed platypus, but it's not going to have, it's not going to be an experience of being a duck-billed platypus. And so Dr. Young's problem was that he wrote from a logos point of view, which is Dr. Peterson's point of view also, which is a scientific perspective. Um, and uh, so he didn't follow his own dictum because both Dr. Peterson and Dr. Jung do refer to the importance of Eros in their books. But, and, but Dr. Jung commented that without experience, the psyche does not accept an idea. It has no meaning. And so you can put all the logos you want into something. Uh, but until you've had the meaning through experience, it's going to be worthless. And I have one, I have taped to my computer uh, a quote from Leonardo da Vinci from Walter Isaacson's biography of Leonardo da Vinci, which is relevant to this point, which hit Leonardo's quote is, he who has access to the fountain does not go to the water jar. And so the point is that, yes, Christianity and all religions are formulated by the word, by logos, but those represent the water jar. But until you've had the experience, which is the water that goes in the water jar, um, it's not going to mean very much. And so there's a very interesting juxtaposition now in the last week. Um, and uh, let me see if I still have it on my screen. I'm not sure. Um, 
the um, the juxtaposition relates to um, to Jordan Peterson, uh, which is this very funny video that was put together by Kitty Flanagan, who is a uh, Australian comedian. And what has happened here? Just a minute. I, I needed to have on my desk my URLs. Okay, so here we are. Um, All right, so here's Kitty Flanagan's Rules for Life. So, as you probably remember from a few weeks ago, another of the nights that John was here with me, um, I was relatively critical of Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules of Life. And the reason for that was that Literally, it had no life in it. <laughs> and it was the water jar without the water. And um, so Kitty Flanagan, whenever, whenever thing, something is um, too much of something in the world, there will be a compensation. And so Kitty Flanagan came up with a comp uh, compensation and that's at the link I've just provided you on the chat and so it's also a metaphor for what happened in Christianity so dr. Peterson puts out his 12 rules of life and what happened was that Kitty Flanagan put out Kitty Flanagan's rules of life and she has 488 rules of life <laughs> and um, so this is an incredibly funny five-minute video uh, where she's commenting on Jordan Peterson's 12 rules. And um, what we need to understand is that humor typically comes from the shadow because humor makes us think of something that we were afraid to think of ourselves in some way. And, um, and so... Um, this is why George, George Bernard Shaw said at one point, uh, you have to make them laugh or they'll kill you. Um, and um, so anyway, this idea that Kitty Flanagan has provided this counterpoint to uh, Jordan Peterson uh, is exactly what happened in uh, traditional Christianity because, okay, we had the Catholic Church and then at the time of the Reformation, it got split into two parts. And then the Protestant side ultimately got split into 400 different parts, very similar in number to Kitty Flanagan's number. Um, and, um, and the I understand the Catholic side, and correct me if I'm wrong, John. Catholicism is now five, split into five, with the Vatican as one, the Russian Orthodox is two, the Greek Orthodox is three, and I think there's a couple of others. There's there's one in Egypt, and the Coptic Church, the Russian Church, the Greek Church, and. Uh... Those are the main ones, but those are Orthodox, so those are Eastern Orthodox. That that split happened before the formation of the Catholic Church. Oh, it it did. Yeah, that was the okay. That was the big split where the Bishop of Rome, who was the Pope, who became right. the Pope, uh, sort of took over, and the other bishops around the world in Antioch and whatnot. And this was before Russia. Um, they uh, they stayed rebelled and said, well. We're going to split off from you. We're not under your control. And then right. later, the missionaries went up to Russia from uh, Constantinople. Right. Okay. So Istanbul, uh, currently Con Constantinople, um, is where the Orthodox Church wa was originally, and it split up. But the point is that, um, you know, in Istanbul, they actually built a cathedral called the Hagia Sophia, which is incredible building, considering it was built in 
about 588 or something like that, five, about 580 AD, and it took five years to build, whereas cathedrals in Western Europe typically took 100 years to build. And to see how they did that is quite remarkable. Okay, so anyway, um, the point is that, that when you make rules, people are going to find ways to slice and dice it and break the rules, and then life, eros, uh, flows in and, and changes things. And there, I took two ideas out of Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning, and uh, here's the book, by the way, if you haven't read it. You've probably heard heard about it because Jordan Peterson is very popular these days. Um, but he, there are two important ideas here. One is that spirit equals process. So think about that. It, instead of talking about the Holy Spirit, we should talk about process because we're in t we're always evolving. Okay, when when human beings are born. Uh, we're basically wild animals. And then through life, through the transformations that I was discussing earlier, uh, we are in the midst of a process that's going on. That's the spirit working through us, but it's but the spirit is also coming through our societies at the local level, at the parish level, uh, at the state level, at the national level, and at the level of humanity as a whole. And so one of the things that Dr. Jung uh, emphasized is that Christian pastors are hypnotized by the events of uh, the Pentecost and the founding of Christianity, the events around Christ's life. Um, but we have kept evolving since then, and that is the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, coming through us, and that's a process. And so the, the question that religion really needs to answer is, where is the Spirit taking us? And we'll talk more about that in the future, I'm sure. Now, the, the other interesting point that Jordan Peterson made was a point about belief. And, of course, his, all his, uh, his debates with Sam Harris and that sort of thing, um, that's over whether the myths of, the, of Christianity or whatever religion are um, true. And the point is that Dr. Jung made is that they're not true in the physical world, they're true in the psychic world. And so it's possible to, despite the fact that you don't believe in the specific myths, which have now been attacked, uh, unmercifully for 15, uh, for 500 years, um, you can believe in Christianity per se and the ideas that it contains, including the myths that it contains, as an organically evolved system of mental hygiene. And so all religions were evolved by people who knew nothing about psychology per se but they knew what worked and they baked that they and they baked what they found into the cake of their rituals and if you look back at the bible again you'll find that many of the things that happen uh, occur as a result of dreams or visions and um, so uh, let us take the miracle of the Virgin Mary. Well, leaving aside the details of, of that virgin birth, let's just say that a pregnant 13-year-old girl in the Middle East 
might have a hard time staying alive even today. And so the miracle of the Virgin Mary is that she survived it all. And when she was pregnant out of wedlock before Joseph married her, and um, so that's one aspect of it, and there certainly was a miracle there. But also, of course, were her dreams and Joseph's dreams, which indicated that she was going to give birth to uh, a special child. So, but my point is that these religions um, developed as organic systems of mental hygiene. And so I know for myself that if I go to a church service, after it, I feel better for it. I don't know why, precisely. Um, and I always remember the Jeffrey Rush character in Shakespeare in Love, who, when he's asked a difficult question about why it will be, why things will be all right, he says, I don't know, it's a mystery. Well, it's a mystery, but if you think about it, if you go to church or meditate or practice some ritual, uh, you're very likely to feel better, and that's because these rituals baked into the cake something that human beings needed, and this has developed over thousands of years, and it evolved. And so that's why um, a marriage has a certain transformational aspect in our psyche, as does a funeral. Um, and basically this is the same reason that the United States became the go-to place in the world. We adopt the best ideas uh, and we destroy the worst ideas from every part of the world. Uh, we accept good ideas from every nationality, um, national origin, uh, race, religion, ethnic background, and we we argue sometimes violently in the Civil War, but mostly peacefully, we argue the bad ideas out of the system. And it's a messy system, and others don't understand it, but it is the way that evolution works. Uh, is it perfect? No, not by quite a margin, but it works and it is inexorable, and the results are uh, as we see them today in the United States. Um, then I want to go on to offer an example, which is the uh, women's liberation movement, women's liberation, sometimes called feminine, uh, or feminism, uh, recently in recent uh, demonstrations, there have been signs that some women held up that said something to the effect of, I can't believe I still have to protest this shit. And the point is that um, these evolutions are ongoing, they're a process, and just because you got something achieved in the 1960s doesn't mean it's going to remain the same. Evolution is a continuous process. Babies are born as wild animals. They all have to evolve from the beginning. And also, it's very interesting, just from my personal experience, I can say something about Japan, where liberation, women's liberation, can mean some something very different. Uh, in Japan, for women, it meant freedom to have premarital sex. And so, um, Christmas is quite... Christmas is quite a popular uh, holiday in Japan because it is the day when many Japanese wi women choose to lose their virginity, and they do this at so-called love hotels uh, in throughout Japan. There, and uh, if you ever go to Japan, you'll notice these because uh, they 
are places of fantasy. One will be built and it looks like a castle, and one looks like a steamship, and one looks like um, uh, the Casbah or whatever, and they're very garish. It's, it's like a, a mini Las Vegas, but these are love hotels because young people have no place to go at home. Their homes are very small, and so they go to these uh, short-time hotels where you can <laughs> book the hotel by the hour or two. <laughs> and, and, um, and it's not necessarily prostitution, but it is what, um, you know, when your parents go away and you invite your girlfriend over, it's that same sort of idea. <laughs> so anyway, okay, so then that got me thinking about Dr. Jung's letter to David Cox from 1957. It's a mystery why it got me thinking about that, but um, let me see if I have the link here. Uh, and uh, by the way, the Ken, there's a Ken Wilbur video that I observed recently that's helpful and I'll put that up um, and Wilbur um, and let's see the David Cox letter Sorry, may not have it, but I, I have it in front of me on my notes. So let me type it in. Uh, th so this is a letter to David Cox, 1957, and it's uh, Dr. Young's confession uh, of his perspective. And it is on the, I read it into the YouTube channel. So it is here. Sorry for this taking a little bit of time, but uh, it's worth listening to that letter. Uh, I think that gets it, and uh, okay, wait a minute now, let me see if I set this up to, to show you on the video, I intended to, but then I might have forgotten, so let me see if I can find it quickly, if I can, that will be useful. Ah, yes, okay. Um, all right, so one, one of the things that happen, I'm just going to give this to you in a moment. Okay, if, if you go to the front page of the YouTube channel, um, you will find this as one of the thumbnails. And this is uh, Dr. Jung's, this is the essence of Dr. Jung's message to the Reverend David Cox. And let's see, I'm going to now reduce that. that enough so I can be in the picture too. Um, 
There it is. Okay. Uh, so the essence of what Dr. Young was saying in the Cox letter was that for intelligent patients that came to him, um, he was able to talk about how he was able to talk about some of these ideas that I've been discussing tonight. And one of them is that God equals the unconscious or the collective unconscious. And I was talking about the collective unconscious a few weeks ago. And so I'll leave it to you to go find that. But the idea is that the God image, the self within us, is can't be differentiated by human beings from the metaphysical God. And then he says, uh, Christ equals the self. Incarnation means integration. That means to incarnate means to bring something into, I mean, literally incarnate means to bring something into meat. And so it's bringing some, something into our physical being. And when we do that, that's integration. And salvation is individuation, which is to understand the way things work in the world and to accept those. And crucifixion is symbolic of wholeness, which is um, to live your life in a fully individuated manner. And so this is Dr. Jung talking about the Christian story from the perspective of psychology, uh, for what it's worth. Um, and so then let's go on. All right, so prayers are petitions to the unconscious. And I think I have that link here. Um, and so if you think that, um, oh, there's the David Cox letter. Okay. Anyway. Um, hmm. Sorry about that. I seem to have misplaced that one too. But if you, oh, wait a minute, here it is. Okay. So Dr. Edinger talks about um, prayers being a petition to the unconscious in this uh, video, which is about the Lord's Prayer and about the seven petitions that are contained in that. And so his point is that that we're asking our unconscious to accomplish these things for us rather than talking to some magical God figure up here who's a puppeteer. And so that link will take you to the first two petitions of the Lord's Prayer and then linked in the description of that video are the other two links that take you through all seven of the petitions in the Lord's Prayer. And so one thing that comes up very often is you find out that a friend has just lost their father or something like that. And it's very common to say, I will pray for you. And that makes you feel better. That will make you f feel better, but very likely it may be cold comfort to the bereaved. And But that isn't to say it won't m help them because it might make them feel better to know that they're not so alone. And so anyway, it's one, a different way of thinking about these issues, that prayer and meditation and so on are all dealing with our unconscious. Um, so 
you know, a prayer does nothing in the physical world by logos, only by action. So if, if you say, I will pray for you, that's one thing. But if you say, I will donate to the charity of your choice, um, which might be an objective of the deceased or his family, then you're actually doing something. That's Eros coming in to put life into the Logos. And in Buddhism, uh, as you probably know, I consider meditation as a kind of passive prayer. Um, but um, you know, it can have, it can force you to have this insight to give to, to the charity. But remember, there's no magic puppeteer up there. So the NFL players are pointing in the wrong direction. They need to point to their heart. And because the God image in them is what made them work out for 10 years and, um, made them strong enough to be successful as a football player at whatever level. Um, but it wasn't a magic puppeteer that was doing that. It was them that was doing that. And so anyway, uh, the next point I wanted to cover was that life is difficult. Okay. All religions recognize that. And the good news about that is we are problem solving creatures. And so uh, we solve problems continuously, constantly, all day long. Uh, we need three meals a day. Making breakfast um, is complicated. Um, we need water. We need the bathroom. Uh, we need to deal with a child's hurt. We need to deal with a boss who is an SOB at all levels. Um, if your wife is asleep, you may not want to wake her when you're making breakfast, as is the case for me. Um, and so I have to know the proper mixture of omelet and the temperature of the stove and health considerations. And one example would be um, the kids who were trapped in the cave in Thailand, uh, that was a pretty, water was a pretty big problem for them because they were fouling their water uh, for those two weeks or three weeks, however long they were in there. And so it's fortunate that they had an adult with them who could uh, think about those kinds of issues and try to deal with them. Um, and so, um, then there's also the issue that religion can be used for political or nefarious purposes. Obviously the Catholic church did that for centuries and both, uh, the GOP and Democrats, um, use religion and the church to maintain power and they both try to mold religion to their brand. And the point of Christ's sacrifice is that he showed us the way, uh, he lived his experiment of his individuation. He lived as if, and all of us have to live as if so he lived as if he were the God man and he did it perfectly. And, um, he, he saved humanity from the fear of God upon death and with the forgiveness of sins. But that is necessary for us all the time and we evolve further. I've talked uh, previously in this group about terror management theory and um, the work of Professor Sheldon Solomon at Skidmore College and his work with the work of Ernest Becker who wrote Denial of Death. Um, and 
Christ's blood did cause change, and blood causes change. And so we have to be conscious of the fact that when something bloody happens, it will cause some change in the human species. Um, and it was interesting to me. I, I wrote, uh, I wrote an article years ago called "There Will Be Blood." Let me see if I can find it. And I have read it into the YouTube channel, so you can find it on the YouTube channel. There's also the hard copy, uh, or not hard copy, but the written uh, version of it, which is uh, linked in that video. Um, but it was interesting to me one time when I took uh, a couple of colleagues who happened to be Hindu to the Easter Sunday service at the U.S. Naval Academy. And of course, the communion is intended for people who have um, uh, become Christian through, uh, through whatever process in their sect is. And, and it's, it's not appropriate for non-Christians to uh, take uh, communion, which represents the blood of Christ. And I was sort of shocked when a couple of my colleagues uh, went up and took communion. I said, what are you doing? What, why did you do this? And they said, um, and one of them said to me, I wanted to take the blessing. And I thought that was a profound statement. Um, and another place that I'll point out about blood is um, about 10 days ago, Saudi Arabia beheaded a Saudi dissident woman. Um, and that was probably the biggest mistake they could make because her blood obviously is going to cause change in Saudi Arabia in a way that they had not expected because they think it's going to cause women to stay down on the farm and be cowed by the, the fear of that happening to them, but I think it will cause all kinds of problems in many different ways. And <clears throat> so one of the things I wanted to observe about cable news harangues, we get those all the time depending on your channel of choice, uh, and what those are doing is that they are pounding on the collective unconscious and they're causing very minor changes because most people don't change their opinion based on what they hear on a cable news program day to day, but it's a process of education uh, for the population because we all have to be trained and it is very subtly changing the collective unconscious of the country. And we're seeing that um, this very week with the death of John McCain and the juxtaposition of his death uh, as compared to the behavior of our president um, side by side with that. But ultimately, um, Ultimately, basically, those cable news programs are um, educating our new generations in what the collective unconscious of the, of the country is in a big picture sort of way. I'm not saying that these things come through in a few minutes. Uh, they come through in, you know, five or ten year increments, I suppose we register where the country is um, every two years when we have a national election. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's a funny scene in the movie The American President where someone says, uh, well, the country has mood swings. And 
the other person says, uh, <laughs> mood swings? What are you talking about? And they said, yeah, mood swings. That's why we take, um, we take uh, polls. And so, um, <clears throat> Let's see. So anyway, I, I just observed that our president is the same type of flashbang as the church did with cathedrals. It made the collective have meaning, and, but it also shows us that all, glitter, all that glitters is not gold. How did Catholics get all those cathedrals built? Well, they persuaded people of those times that there was meaning in building that cathedral and they kept it going for a hundred years each usually and you can think about how did the cru crusades work and and why did they stop well one thing they were a way for the nobility of Europe uh, to get all that testosterone out of the country so they wouldn't revolt, right? <laughs> and and, uh, and so the kings were happy because they were being left alone. Um, but the problem was that after a couple hundred years of the kingdom of Jerusalem, um, they found that they didn't get what they want wanted and so this is reflected in uh, Dr. Jung's The Red Book in the first sermon the first of the seven sermons of the dead where there it begins with a quote we have been to Jerusalem where we did not find what we sought and so that's a key issue and so then going back to Ken Wilber for a moment uh, and his wake up, clean up, grow up uh, ideas. The wake up, the God image is, re is the religion making archetype in the unconscious, the self in Dr. Jung's way of putting it. The clean up is to understand and control our emotions, but drugs are not the way to do that. We have to do it through some organic way because obviously drugs have caused us huge problems in this country. 62,000 people killed last year in, um, in the United States. And then grow up, we have to realize that there's no magic puppeteer. The atheists say, but the scientific method God, and they have the God of materialism, but again, uh, what they have is the water jar without the water. <clears throat> and agnostics simply say, I don't know, and that many of us are confused in our confusion. And Dr. Jung said, I know. Well, what did he know? I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a little while. Now, then there's Dr. Peterson, who uh, very clearly understands how the mind works mechanistically, and he knows what rules work and when, and that is demonstrated in both Maps of Meaning and 12 Rules of Life. But what are the chances you can pull out a book when you need a rule, or even remember there was a rule? If you're in an argument with your wife, will she accept Yep, Jordan Peterson was right about his rule number seven, or whichever it is. If you believe that, you're a special kind of stupid. So anyway, um, so and uh, just to finish up a little a little bit on this overall idea about Christianity. Yes, Christianity can be believed by those who are atheists or agnostics, but not as a magic formula with the myths being correct, but rather as an evolved 
system for mental hygiene, not because myths, not because of myths debunked by science, but true of all religions, that they are these evolved systems. And um, just interesting, yesterday I, my wife had me watch a movie called The Giver. Uh, I would recommend it to you. What that movie demonstrates is a world of pure logos and what that means. And if, if you think the all logos all the time dictum of uh, Dr. Peterson as he often presents it and certainly presented it in 12 Rules of Life, if you think that's a good idea, then I recommend you see this movie, The Giver. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to take a short break from my exegesis here to ask John and uh, to look on and see if there are any comments that I should reply to, and then I'll go on. John, so far? Yeah, that's interesting. I like your last comment about Jordan Peterson because I do get the feeling watching him that he's kind of self-tortured in a way because mm -hmm. of the extreme logos, um, the rationality and trying to figure everything out. It's, um, I think he has a depth that he knows there's something beyond, beyond it, something behind it, but he's he's a little afraid to explore that, I get the feeling. Right, and I, I think it's the same problem that Dr. Jung was having in paragraph 63 of Ion, because he, he could not, even though he said it, even though he said that the psyche doesn't believe something until... Um, until it's experienced it. You can tell it all you want, but until it's experienced, it's not going to believe it. And he, he said that explicitly, and Jordan Peterson in Maps of Meeting does say that explicitly, but then they both fell back on the scientific method and on the logos and, and on the physical world and, and didn't emphasize the need for the experience. And, you know, it reminded me, as I mentioned before, that, um, that there was, um, when uh, Representative Scalise was shot, before he was shot last summer, a uh, year ago, um, he had, he was commenting one day on some dictum that Steve Bannon had come over to Congress and lectured the Republicans in Congress. And Scalise's response was, um, he, re he reminded me of my father when I was 18 and I didn't li listen to him either. Right? <laughs> and, and so the point is that the father was giving you all these rules isn't going to be very helpful until you've actually gone out and had some experience. So, anyway. Um, I have one other comment, which is go about ahead. the cathedrals. Yeah. It is a curiosity how they, how they must have prepped the public to keep those projects going because they had to be extremely expensive. And so I'm, I thought that was interesting that you brought that up. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> Great. Anyway. So. Yeah. Um, so uh, I see that Thomas has recommended a movie uh, called Agora. Have you ever seen that movie? It's no. about the fifth century woman, um, woman philosopher named Hypatia. And Thomas also says, I'm reading that Israel Gomgam, the woman activist, has not yet been beheaded in Saudi Arabia. Okay, um, I I only heard of that peripherally, so I hope that that's that she won't be beheaded. Obviously, but I think that someone like that, like Christ, knows that their their blood 
is going to cause change. And Christ certainly had that intuition. And, um, you know, he was he was the perfect God, except, and he lived that experiment, that representation, but he showed the perfection of his God-man situation when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, and, uh, you know, I certainly hope that this woman uh, is not beheaded, but I, I don't know. I only heard about that. And it so happens that I've traveled in uh, Saudi Arabia quite a lot, about six months since 2002. Uh, I've, I've been physically in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia for about six months of that time. And I have visited uh, Deira in Riyadh, where they commit those executions, and um, it's uh, it's quite an experience to physically be there. And it turns out that it's right on a haberdashery row, so there are all these shops that sell um, Saudi attire along that street where that happens. It's a very logos-oriented place, I guess, mm. <laughs> and. Um, it's funny, now that you mention it, I, I think um, of my experience. When I go to Saudi Arabia, typically I'm there for a week or two, and I'm not really conscious of what's happening to me as a man during that period. But of course, uh, women in Saudi Arabia typically are wearing black curtains. And so you don't really interact with women. And I know that um, every when I would fly out of Saudi Arabia, even to the Emirates, and I would see a woman in public in the Emirates just, you know, wearing perfectly modest clothing, but I would see her hair and so on. And I definitely had a visceral experience like, oh, that's a woman. And, and it's very much like this, what happens at the end of The Giver, where this society that's all black and white, and all of a sudden it turns to color. And it, it has, it's very much that feel, right? That all of a sudden, oh, you know, there's a whole part of life that I've, been missing because I've been in this man's country for <laughs> for a week or two and you don't feel it coming over you because you're busy working and you're not thinking about it and then you go out and you actually see a woman and you go oh my god there's a woman <laughs> um, okay uh, so let's see Slain Han says, Hi, Skivit. Sean, I sent you the message about asking about the physics, physical truth of, re, of religious claims. Um, yes, I remember that. And uh, it, is there uh, something that you wanted to say uh, about that? Um, the, I mean, I think what I've said is that um, that it's Dr. Jung's position, which you can find on paragraph 752 of Answer to Job, that every religious statement without exception is a statement of the psyche and not a statement of the physical world. And if that were not the case, they would be covered in the textbooks of natural science. So that's Dr. Jung's position on, on that uh, statement. Okay, so then I then as my um, revelation evolved here, and I'm writing as feverishly as I can could. The next thing that came to me was uh, 
the point a point about the value of stories, myths, and fairy tales. And so, what are what are the values of them? Well, first of all, they're valuable for education of the young, uh, because children are born as wild animals, and we have to train them. Um, we get things done in our family, in our community, and in our uh, nation as a whole uh, when we have uh, a myth or a fairy tale. I'll, I'll give you an example of um, the Vietnam War, <clears throat> where the U.S. government sold us a fairy tale about the domino theory. And as a result of our fear of that, uh, we sent uh, about three million men to Vietnam to fight a war that we still lost. <laughs> and uh, so number three is um, to articulate values. For example, the Ten Commandments is an example of that. Um, number four, uh, there's the issue of the problem of lies and truth always comes out and there there's a myth that myth means uh, not true not me not now but in fact myths and fairy tales are stories that are um, perhaps hyper true because they contain the consolidation of archetypes that have been developed over many many years john you you talked about that could you just about the fairy tales about book? fairy tales yeah well they start out as local sagas if that's what you mean the yeah well, they start out as, as probably somewhat isolated true events that are real events right that turn into local <clears throat> stories and tales and those turn into local sagas which are then shared with other communities and they're built upon and expanded and those become fairy tales or myths right um, according to this is according to um, Marie, uh, Marie Maria Marie Louise Marie Louise von Franz right. book on fairy tales which is a fascinating book yeah I just wanted to I, I give you an example of what happens in a in a fairy tale uh, if I can catch it here on my iPhone quickly I'll just show you the picture um, okay so how many of you have had the pleasure of drinking some Kirin beer and what does kidding mean the word kidding okay so here's oops what okay maybe it's give it to me here uh, so it wants me to be over 21 to get the site. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay, let me see if I can get it as kidding image. Okay. I don't want to keep you uh, waiting here, um, but kidding here, this might work. Okay, so um, kidding beer, which is an extremely popular beer in Japan, um, has on its label a creature like this, uh, and this is a kirin, a kirin. And it looks like a kind of dragon. Uh, and so the question is, what is the kidding? And the kidding, literally, the literal translation of kidding is giraffe. And the reason is because 1500 or 2000 years ago, 
someone saw a giraffe in your in Africa and then there was this telephone game going out across the Khyber Pass and all the way through China and all the way into Japan and by the time the description of this creature reached Japan uh, that's how the artist rendered it like that and so that's a kidding um, how long did that process take of transmission do you know oh I don't know probably a thousand years I suppose <laughs> uh, uh, so Tom uh, Sean went to sleep and understandably uh, and Thomas says France guillotined their last person in 1977 a staggering thing to know absolutely but you know we, we're still executing people in the United States whether we do it by beheading or some other way uh, <clears throat> and uh, okay so anyway the one of the points in the problem of lies, which is point number four of my value, values of stories and myths, is karma. And that is, um, that comes up especially in Buddhism and Hinduism. But I, the point about it is that you get away with something now, but your conscience knows. And so it can result in an accident later and it works on you unconsciously um, and so you may think you've gotten away with something uh, and in fact uh, you have an automobile accident because your consciousness is distracted by your conscience and it causes you to have a crack so the point that the Jungians make is that the universe is in balance and if you're going to do something dastardly it's going to catch you <clears throat> and one interesting idea is the myth of Icarus where Icarus got too big for his britches so he flew too close to the Sun and his uh, wings um, the wax that was holding his wings together melted and he fell to the earth. Well, Dr. Jung had an example of someone who was a, a mountain climber. He met him on the street and he told Dr. Jung that he had a dream about falling off a mountain. And Dr. Jung said, you better not go on that mountain ever again and the man ignored him and three months later he fell to his death uh, on that very mountain <laughs> so, <laughs> it can happen and uh, my fifth point is that the psyche knows what it wants so my psyche knew that my future wasn't to become com uh, commandant of the marine corps and so on january the 4th 1990 I was walking across a parking lot uh, at Marine Corps Base Quantico and boom I was down and uh, I broke my leg and that was the last thing I did in uniform and um, so it ended my Marine Corps career which lasted 23 years um, but at the beginning of my Marine Corps year there was uh, Vietnam and I had the experience that I knew it was wrong but I had to have the experience to know why and I consciously had that revelation even then when I was when I was 19 years old and joined the Marine Corps um, I knew that I had to go to Vietnam and find out why it was wrong and the way I knew that it was wrong was in 1962 uh, so three years before the Marines were officially in Vietnam my father took me down to the 
docks at Fleet Activities Yokosuka, uh, which is the headquarters of the Seventh Fleet, and he showed me a line of ships that was going out of Tokyo Bay, and he said, um, you see that, Skip? And I said, yeah, Dad. He said, that's the Marines. They're going to Vietnam. And I said, why, Dad? And he said, well, everybody in the military, everyone in the military, mind you, this was 1962 he said this to me, everybody in the military is has either been to Vietnam, is there now, or is going there. And uh, I said, why, Dad? And he said, well, because the, the generals need wars in order to gain advancement. And um, so that didn't seem right to me. And so I, so then uh, in August of 1964, um, the Gulf of Tonkin incident occurred. And on one specific day, President Johnson uh, said that the, the marriage deferment from the draft was going to end at midnight. And immediately couples were um, in lines around, around the blocks trying to get married so that they could have this uh, deferment. And I thought that was wrong too. And I, I felt that, um, you know, those people were just cowards that didn't want to do the necessary to uh, represent the needs of our country. And, um, and so that was another reason why I joined. But now, um, it so happens that Oliver North was a classmate of mine uh, at the basic school. And I've run into Ollie a few times over the years. And so uh, today we have uh, Oliver North war stories and we have Skip's Jung stories. So the question is, which will have staying power in the collective unconscious? That's a, that's a hypothetical question. Again. Rhetorical question. Okay. Um, so then I wanted to um, to review the maps of meaning, and which is Jordan Peterson's book. And so my first comment about it is that it's a brilliant book, and I learned a lot from it. I'd never studied psychology formally. Um, I'll be right back with you. So, John, um, Okay, um, so uh, John has had to leave to return to Baltimore where he lives. Um, so I never studied psychology and I, I learned a lot uh, from Maps of Meaning, so I highly recommend it. Uh, my second idea about it is that it's uh, too tightly packed for the average person um, and you need uh, Jordan Peterson's lectures uh, and Jordan Peterson is definitely providing a service by conveying these ideas out into the ether and uh, he's doing a phenomenal job because yesterday I took a look at at his uh, September Q&A and at that time YouTube was saying that he had 35,000 listeners online and by comparison, last week we had a very good week on this channel, uh, which was uh, in the course of the two hours, uh, we had 74 people uh, access uh, the live stream. So I appreciate that very much, uh, but it's nothing in comparison to Jordan Peterson. And um, so,
So then I ask the question, what do we know? Well, in the sciences, if we take things like weather or light or uh, quantum mechanics, um, we think we know things, but we really don't. Uh, scientists can't explain why the two-slit experiment in with light works. Um, they can't, you know, even though we have gradually better weather forecasts since 50 years ago, um, still we can't predict with any certainty. And with quantum mechanics, we no, it's there, but we, there's a lot of things we don't know about it. And uh, so can we change the rules in those? Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> okay. Um, what do we know about religion? So there are two ideas about God. There's God, the metaphysical God, which is the subject of theology and the God image or the self, which is the subject of Jungian psychology, one of the major topics. And how does religion work? The answer is, I don't know, it's a mystery, but it works. And um, what are the uses of religion? Uh, they provide mental hygiene, value systems that work and the abuses of religion obviously are politics, uh, materialism, which we can think of as an empty God because if you get that 63 foot yacht um, and then it sits at the dockside, um, that's certainly an empty God. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to skip that since I've talked about it. I don't want to be too repetitious. Um, but one thing I do want to emphasize is that this point about requiring both logos and experience this is where atheists, agnostics, and magical thinking parishioners miss the boat because um, they don't understand this fundamental point about how these things work. Um, so slicing and dicing only makes it possible to teach, but without the experience, it's not internalized. The psyche ignores it. And Atheists, atheists want to say, there's nothing here, move along, but they're wrong. How are they wrong? Let me count the ways. <laughs> Too many to count. Um, so, and I also wanted to mention the effect of ri ritual on the unconscious. The rituals of religions have been developed uh, over thousands of years and the people who have developed them have baked them into the cake. And in many cases, we really don't know why they work, uh, but they do work. I mean, there are pretty much what we know as Western wedding ceremonies everywhere in the world. I've been to weddings in, in Taiwan, in um, many in Japan, in India, and in uh, the Middle East. And so they do have an effect on us. And um, so I wanted to make one caveat about Dr. Jung's oeuvre, which is that you should learn what Dr. Jung was trying to say, grok him, and then go make up your own mind. And um, I, then I started to think about how does this play out in our politics? And so this is going to get a little bit dicey, probably. Um, it seems to me that um, the Republican Party sells fear and operates by trying to steal elections. 
uh, with the exception of Eisenhower. Eisenhower was a hypostasis, which is um, a return to the status quo ante. In other words, the country had been through the Depression and World War II and really wanted something stable, uh, or a leader who was very stable uh, in the country. And allowing the country to get back into normal living after those crises that have been going on for uh, more than 20 years. And so it was natural to turn to a leader that everybody believed in. The Democrats, on the other hand, sell hope, and unfortunately, they they have coasted too much. So they've they left the Midwest out to dry Previously, I hope they're doing better now, but I don't know directly. And so, um, you know, the Democrats always had the unions, for example, but they let the, they coasted and, and let the uh, unions disintegrate and that, uh, and let our industrial economy disintegrate too rapidly and the result was that it left a lot of people behind and so um, so now I don't know where we are but we have to each of us make our own decisions about what's right so I just wanted to go through the presidents since Roosevelt so Roosevelt sold was a Democrat and he sold hope nothing to fear but fear itself and uh, he also said, uh, the only thing that doesn't change is change itself. And um, then we had Truman, again, a Democrat. He was selling hope also, and he was coasting on Roosevelt's legacy. Then we had Eisenhower. He was this hypostasis. Um, getting out of the Depression, World War II. He could have run on either ticket. Um, he was a hero. Uh, and so in case of another war, namely uh, the Cold War, uh, he, was, he was tested, I guess. Then we had Kennedy, who sold the hope for the new generation, tem tempered by war. And then Johnson, who sold hope and coasted on Kennedy's legacy. Then Nixon came in as a Republican and he sold fear and dirty tricks. And Ford, another Republican, pardoned Nixon. And so his, um, he was tarnished by the, by the Nixon legacy and the hypothesis there. Uh, he was followed by Jimmy Carter, who again was selling hope and getting back to normal life post-Nixon. Um, then Reagan ran on fear based on the Iran, uh, Iran hostage crisis, and, uh, which was resolved the day he took office. Um, Bush 41... Uh, operated on fear and brought us Gulf War One, and war became a strategy of the GOP and they, the neocons were selling us at that time uh, liquid war and I'm not sure they've gotten away from that as yet. Uh, Clinton came along, he was the man from hope and he wanted to stop war. Um, Bush 43 came in uh, with a, a odor of election tampering and again then fear post 9-11 so that um, probably got him re-elected in 2004. Uh, then Obama was very clearly selling hope. Uh, his poster said hope on it and he was no drama Obama and Trump came along and he sold fear and glitter and um, he again was into uh, election tampering. Um, 
this time apparently with the Russians. We'll have a very interesting fall to see how that works. So we can see pretty clearly by thinking through those uh, administrations that uh, we have consistently had uh, one party selling us fear and the other far party selling us hope. Um, but true, democ true democracy, um, there's some are more than others, but in true democracy, it's really like bumper cars tempering steel. Um, and the true democracies adopt the best and dump the worst in noisy debate. Examples uh, would be the US, the UK, Japan, Germany, and EU post-World War II, of course. But um, autocracy, on the other hand, prevents debate. And so in those examples, we have pre-war Japan and Germany. And then we got World War II. It shuts down creativity of the society and the impurities remain in the system. There's no tempering. And so examples of that today would be Turkey and Egypt. So these are all processes. Uh, we're never done with them. That's where the feminists from the 1960s missed the point when they put the sign up, um, you know, why am I still protesting this shit? Because we're never one and done, no matter what. Uh, we're all evolving and we will always be evolving because all children are born as wild animals and we have to bring them along and evolve them in, a pro in an appropriate way for our time. And so there's the old Pennsylvania Dutch saying, too soon old, too late smart. <laughs> and um, so in the end, the point about the divine drama now, and this is my closing point, uh, the point about the divine drama is uh, you can't just think it up and write it down. It has to fulfill the needs of the collective unconscious at large, whatever that is. And so whatever it is, whatever changes, whatever evolutions have to take place, um, they have to take place in such a way that everybody within the group uh, can accept them. And, and so that is best done in this organic way, the way religions came up. And so I think if we think about uh, the idea of belief, um, let's grant to the atheists, agnostics, and uh, scientists that um, the magical ideas of Christianity are not correct, but that Christianity, Christianity and all other religions are organically developed systems of mental hygiene that do work. And we may not know why they work, but those would be um, research questions for some of you to look into in the future, because uh, they are um, quite meaningful. And if you can understand their meaning, uh, then you can get back aboard the religions because they have value to us and they may save you from going to a psychiatrist someday. Um, so. so Thomas says there's quite a difference between the truth of myth and such a thing as urban myths. Um, agreed. Um, and then he says, hypostasis, is that the word you're using? Yes, that's the word I'm using, which, as I understand it, is the, a word that means to reestablish the status quo as it was before, um, where, whereas uh, the average man, when he's 
disturbed in his reality always wants to go back to the way things were and how, th how it was done in the old days because that's more comfortable. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, I have blasted through this thing. I don't know if it has been of value to any of you. I hope so. Um, I'm going to take that image off the screen for the time being. Um, but it helped me that two-hour period when I had this rush of ideas uh, did help me bring together a lot of ideas that I've been um, working with and trying to understand and so I hope it's I hope it's of some help to all of you now um, there will be no official meeting of the group next Monday as as it is Labor Day in the United States it's a national holiday which I intend to um, respect and uh, the next class which will be on September 10th uh, we are going to have a reunion group meeting of the local reading group and all of the regulars including John who was here tonight have agreed to come to uh, Sammy's Italian Pizza Kitchen in Eastport which is part of Annapolis, Maryland and uh, meet with us live um, two weeks from tonight at 8 p.m. <clears throat> Eastern U.S. time. And uh, Sammy has, uh, since last year, when we stopped going to his place, uh, he has installed Wi-Fi. And so I'm given to believe that with my trusty iPhone, I will be able to broadcast to the world uh, through YouTube. And so you will be able to um, interact uh, with the group as you wish. I'm not going to have a clear uh, topic for that evening, uh, but something may come up in the next two weeks. You never know. Uh, but if any of you have ideas of what, about what you'd like us to talk about, I would welcome your ideas. Uh, your thoughts and um, so we ha will have a local group if you're within reach you're welcome to join us at Sammy's Italian Pizza Kitchen uh, at 8 p.m. on September 10th and if you haven't joined our advanced reading group you might want to consider doing that we've now gotten through um, most of chapter five, we still have some uh, complex parts of chapter five to discuss in the seminar. Um, and that will be done on Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Uh, so anyway, um, Developing spiritual stamina. Um, Thomas says, I, I saw a phrase that is stuck in my head, developing spiritual stamina. I, I think that, you know, as we mature as adults, we have to develop all kinds of stamina. And uh, spiritual stamina is a, certainly a part of it. But I think it seems to me that a significant part of it, of spiritual stamina, relates to bringing together so many of these ideas so that we can see why they are meaningful and why they continue to be meaningful to us. I mean, I think in the last hundred years especially, um, all kinds of religious traditions have had trouble because they face the same issues that you face with atheists 
who say, well, we've pro proved your myth isn't true, and therefore, you know, your religion isn't worth anything, and that's not true. Uh, and that's not true, and people haven't understand, understood um, that religion does provide us with a system for mental hygiene which is organically developed. They're different around the world, but they all functionally do the same thing. And if we start to understand that, uh, then we might want to go back to the churches, synagogues, and mosques uh, rather than going to the psychiatrists and psychologists. Uh, you know, that's just a thought that I'm... Um, but Dr. Young makes this uh, funny reference to a quote that's in Faust, uh, and it's uh, the, the character that's saying it is called the Proctophantasmist. So the Proctophantasmist says, um, he says, are you still here? Nay, we've said the enlightening word, be gone. <laughs> And so the Enlightenment was the scientific method coming in and, and teaching us a lot of things about our environment, obviously, over the last 500 years. But it had the effect of pushing away the spiritual side of man's nature. And um, people have ignored psychology, I think, because they don't think it's central to our needs as human beings. But Dr. Jung's point was that it is quite central to our lives in every respect. So anyway, um, and uh, Thomas, uh, hypostasis uh, came up in um, in Edinger's work when he was talking about uh, the end of the Babylonian captivity for the Jews, which occurred about 500 BC. And, and um, the Jews were trying to reestablish their community after the Babylonian captivity. And he refers to that as hypostasis. And he does say that um, Dr. Jung was uh, given to using that word very frequently. So anyway, um, I say good night to you and thank you for joining this evening. I will see you in two weeks uh, broadcasting live from Sammy's Italian Pizza Kitchen. In the meantime, I expect I will be doing some um, readings and uh, there will be the class, the advanced reading group seminar on Wednesday, uh, both this Wednesday and the Wednesday after Labor Day as normal. So see you then. Talk to you soon. Bye.